Hello. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Now, today we have another special build because this will be the first ever mini ITX build on this channel. Now, my client wanted something budget oriented while still being portable because they go to school in another province. Now, some of you might be asking, will a PC this small even be powerful? Well, the answer is yes. And nowadays, there's no limit on how much power you can pack into a small form factor like this. Now, if you're new to small form factor builds or SFF, I would highly recommend a channel called Optimum Tech. Now, this guy specializes in these type of builds and I'm super jealous about a lot of his builds. I'll put a link up here in the corner. Now, this build in front of us was around 1100 Canadian or 860 USD. And currently, it is very close to Christmas, so we did pay a premium for a couple components. The one that hurt the most was this $400 1660 Super. And yeah, let's try to forget that happened. Now, if you're planning to build a PC, Christmas is the worst time to build because of availability. So keep that in mind if you're planning to build. All right, now for parts, we have 16 gigs of RAM by XPG, a Ryzen 5 2600X, a 480 gig SSD, a B450i motherboard by MSI, a 750 watt power supply by Cooler Master, and this overpriced 1660 Super, and the infamous Cooler Master Elite 110. Now what's great about this case is that you can use a regular ATX size power supply, so you don't need to sell a kidney to get a small form factor or an SFX power supply. All right, enough talking, let's go to the casting table. Now just look how cute this little guy is. It has everything built in, including Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and it even has an M.2 slot in the back. Great job AMD, I thought you were actually going to use the exact same cooler for all of your CPUs, but surprisingly this X variant has a copper slug in the middle of the heatsink to help dissipate heat. Great attention to detail. Now if you wanted to rotate the fan shroud, you will need to unscrew the screw under here to gain access to the four screws on the corners to rotate the entire assembly. Now one interesting thing that a regular person may not see is the copper slug that they put in. They didn't even take the time to take the pigtail off. Alright, so here's the final product. This case measures around 15 liters in volume and one of the main challenges when building in a small form factor like this is heat dissipation. And this case was no exception. As you can see here, the non-modular power supply was a huge challenge with this case because there were so many extra cables that were not required and taking up valuable space in the case. Now some of you might be thinking that the cables are restricting airflow, but if you haven't seen the video on Linus Tech Tips channel where they needed to shove 5 boxes, a Santa hat, and a t-shirt into a computer case to affect the temperature in any way, I'll put a link in the description. 
And in this situation, the 120mm intake fan has direct flow into the CPU cooler. But as you can see here, there is barely any clearance between the power supply and the CPU cooler. For benchmark results, on Cinebench R20, we scored 2905 while hitting a maximum temperature of 93 degrees on this CPU as expected. And while in Unigen Heaven, we hit a score of 2525 with a maximum temperature of 83 degrees. The GPU was overclocked for this test and it hit a maximum temperature of 75 degrees with plus 200 on the core and 0 on the memory. I guess I forgot to test with the memory overclocked. Okay, so there were a couple things that we needed to fix with this build, starting with the heat issue. And the always on fan in the power supply is super loud, especially because this PC is set up on a desk. We ordered an affordable 120mm AIO by Goldenfield and the semi fanless modular power supply. The fan only turns on when the system load is above 15% of the 750 watt capacity. Now, as you can see here, there is way more room for activities now with the modular power supply, even with the push pull fans. The results were a 7 degree drop in temperature when we used the max power and heat stress test on Prime95 for 15 minutes, for a max temperature of 86 degrees. Now this is still pretty toasty but under gaming loads we sit comfortably in the 60 to 70 degree mark depending on the game. And the new modular power supply is noticeably quieter as well. But I think there is still room for improvement in the future. Now I personally have the Corsair TX750M power supply and it is near silent when operating because of its high static pressure fan. The reason we didn't go with the Corsair power supply was because there was a $44 difference between the two units and the noise from the Cooler Master unit isn't enough to offset the price. Yet. And the final tweak we made to this build was my donation of these two 120mm Noctua fans to be put in push-pull config. Now I know what some of you are going to say about the fans being an airflow optimized design. Which is true, but the benefit of these two fans is the acoustic levels and with the 1200 RPM, these fans are very quiet at their max speed while still pushing a decent amount of air through the restrictive medium like a radiator. We hit the same 86 degrees on the max core temperature, but it was much quieter with the new fan setup versus the stock fan that ran at 2200 RPM. On Cinebench R15, we hit 78 degrees with a 1278 score. And on Cinebench R20, we hit 80 degrees with a 2877 score. On Unigen Heaven, we hit a max CPU temperature of 73 degrees, which is more realistic of what we would see during gaming. There has been a move towards mini ITX builds in the past year or two. Hopefully in the near future, one of my clients would like to build in something like an NR200. But until then, thank you all so much for making it this far in the video. Please consider subscribing, and I'll see you all in the next one.